this is the kind of thing that I would be tempted to score as bad faith. I'm white and I've got everything I need. No one clutches their purses when they're in a room alone with me. And I can drive for any neighborhood I please. At any hour, and the police don't do a thing. So if I see a penny on the ground, I leave it alone and fucking flip it. I'm a straight white male in America. I've got everything I need. I'm a guy getting paid more than a girl with a degree. And I can walk down the streets after dark, no one wants to rape me. And I can get a girl pregnant and just as easily flee. Just like my straight white male dad did to me. So if I see a penny on the ground, I leave it alone and fucking flip it. I'm a straight white male in America. I've got all the luck I need. I've got a pile of broken mirrors and I'm walking under ladders and I'm spilling tons of salt. But to me that doesn't matter because my skin and my gender and my orientation are the best things to have if you live in this nation. I recommend it highly. a penny on the ground I leave it alone and fucking flip it I'm a straight white male in America I've got all the luck I need Shit's gonna work out for me Cause I'm a straight white male in America I've got all the luck I need Hey everybody, welcome to the Intellectual Dollar Tree We do the show live on Twitch every Wednesday at 7pm Pacific that's twitch.tv slash Echoplex Media. Usually joined by my co-host HK, but ooh, today it's I'm here with my favorite co-host of all, no co-host. Um, Homo Alono, as we say around here. I'm producer Dave. You can find me on Grinder, And I don't know, this is the part where my co-host usually introduces himself. So I figured we'd go visit our old friends at Trigonometry. And I happen to have paused the intro so you don't know who the fuck they're talking to if you're watching this live. But boy, has this uh, been an ongoing um, person we've been covering around here and somebody I've been familiar with for the better part of my adult life because I worked in technology for quite some time. It's fucking Peter Thiel. Peter Thiel, thank you so much for uh, giving us your time, hosting us here in your office. Uh, it's great to be with you. Uh, the first thing I want to ask you if you were God, if I was rich, my office would be so much more dope than that two questions that are very tied in together. You're one of the most visionary people, I think, that we could possibly talk to. Where are we today, the Western world, and where are we gonna be 10, 15, 20 years from now, do you think? Well, it's, uh, and th those are, it's, it's, it's hard to tell, um, questions about the future are re really hard for people to answer. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the, you know, my, my, my thesis, um, that I've articulated in various forms over the last 15, 20 years, is that, uh, is that um, as regards questions of technology and, and science, uh, we've been in a relatively stagnant period for something like 40 or 50 years since, since maybe- Oh, not this ago. shit again. We haven't, we've been fairly stagnant in fucking science and technology for the last 40 or 50 years. Get the fuck out of here. Get the absolute fuck out of here. That, uh, that, um, that uh, you know, there is, there is a tremendous amount that's happened in the world of bits around computers, internet, mobile internet, maybe. Like crypto. all the shit that you made billions of dollars on. You're like, eh, nothing really. No, we didn't make any new technology. Maybe now um, AI. Um, but but uh, many other things that would have been called technology in say, let's say 1967, the year I was Yeah, born. but at one point, fire was called technology. What do you mean? Oh, because the things, he's just mad that he's not sending a dude to Venus. Like uh, rockets, supersonic aviation, underwater cities, the green revolution, agriculture, new medicines have, uh, have, have really stagnated. And this sort of world of adepts has seen, um, has seen uh, dramatically 
less progress. And the world of atoms is seen genetic, dramatically. I hate this shit. Bull fucking shit. Think about just how much your phone has changed in the last 10 years. These are all iterative, but think about how powerful your phone is. And then he said 40 years. Think about your phone versus any piece of fucking technology that existed at all 40 years. Think about a flip phone versus some shit you could get 40 years ago. 40 years ago was 1984. Thesis that I've articulated about, and it's about the present and maybe the, you know, the last 50, 50 years or so um, of, our, of our past. Uh, it's, it gets debated a lot. People don't you know, agree with it. It's very hard to figure out because... Also, like 50 years ago, he's talking about the era, right? It's funny they all land on this period of time right around the Civil Rights Act. I find this interesting. Oh, we haven't done shit since the Civil Rights Act. I think that's what is being like peddled here. It, it is probably perhaps also a, a feature of late modernity that uh, things are extremely specialized. And so, uh, you know, who, who are you to say that there's no like 50 years ago, J.D. Vance wasn't possible theory because it takes half a lifetime of study to even you know get a handle on on it or what's going on in quantum computers or cancer research and so it's it's extremely hard uh to to get a handle on these things but uh my sense is that in many areas of the sciences uh of, of of many of these stem fields have been quite corrupted politicized bureaucratized oh yes science was never political um you know, de-risked, where people aren't willing to have bold ideas, uh, take risks, and uh, we have this sort of incrementalism uh, and uh, snail's pace. Uh, Does he think that the fucking science wasn't, oh, scientific progress wasn't always incremental? Right, because when we look back on the past, we tend to compress the past, right? We, if you think about, like, the period between the Civil War and World War One, in our minds, we just compress that time. A time wouldn't compressed if you lived in it. Of a progress, and it it shows up. Uh, it shows up in a lot of different ways, but uh, economically, it shows up in in these sort of stagnant living standards, in you know uh, governments that uh, uh, have ever rising debt because you know we're you know, it's, it's okay to have debt. And if I was that rich, I'd get a better die a job growth, too. And if you don't have growth, it's it's very very dangerous, and uh, it um, it. And, and it, it shows up in sort of a variety of different ways. And that's, that's what I think uh, has, been, has been the story for some time. And, and probably, uh, probably if one were to extrapolate, my mid, mid, median case is that that's what continues. We continue to have you know, a certain um, powerful progress in the world of uh, bits uh, and uh, continued uh, regulation, stagnation, sclerosis, whatever you want to call it, in, in, in the world of atoms, which is... In my judgment, the more important part, because we're you know we're physically embodied beings, and uh, you know we, we don't want we don't just want an app that tells you that you're going to get dementia. We want <laughs> we want actually cures for that too. So yeah. But like diseases of old age are going to be pretty fucking like dementia is a disease of old age, and there may just be an upper limit for like how long our bodies and minds can fucking sustain themselves, even with the even with technological advances. You know, it's not just on the level of, of data and information. And you said in the speech you, uh, around 10 years ago now that in the modern West, courage is in shorter supply than genius. A, what did you mean exactly? And B, why does that matter? Well, um, well, there's sort of are a lot of, a lot of different, different applications of it, but uh, it's, you know, it's, it's, you know, I, I often, I often, have said that uh, you know our, our greatest political problem, in a sense, is the problem of political correctness, of uh, of the sort of uh, conformity of thought, and uh, and then you know if if we're and the question is always you know, in order to get fresh new ideas and uh, you know a larger surface area of discussion and debate, do we need do we need great genius? So also that the interesting thing about this guy is this guy hasn't worked a day in his life in the sciences. He just hasn't. And so this is all like fan. This is all like ignorance about the sciences. Dis a lot of disrespect, actually, to the people who work in those fields. I also don't work in the sciences. I'm not going to run around saying that those people are all fucking not doing anything. 
one, I don't understand most of what they're doing. Well, at the, at the edge, at the edges, right? That where he's talking about, or, or at least where he's supposedly talking about at the edges, at the bleeding edge where new advances in technology are going to come from. The average person doesn't understand it. And just because he's rich doesn't mean that he's not just the average person or a lay person in these fields. Um, because, you know, it's, it's maybe it's extremely hard to have new ideas or, um, or is it just like some sort of courage of going against certain kinds of social norms and things like that? And, and, you know, my intuition is the problem of political correctness, you know, is, is, is very great. The con pressures for conformity, you know, you mean like being, being like in the sciences, political correctness, does he mean like not being a giant piece of shit to your colleagues? Is that what he's talking about when he says political correctness? Or does he mean like not busting out the calipers and measuring people's skulls? Like, what is he talking about when he says political correctness? Some sense are, and you know, people don't get sent to the gulag, but they, they, they somehow the felt sense is, is that these pressures are extremely high. And that's why, you know, even a, you know, a little bit more courage would uh, probably do a lot of good. Peter, isn't genius a combination of the two? Because you need to have the brilliant idea, but you also need to vocalize the idea, and then you also need to implement it. And if you think so, about- like the underpinning of all this is this great man of history myth, right? Where it's like one person did all, like fucking the idea, like everybody's like, oh, Einstein did this. Well, I mean, Einstein was the lead researcher on relativity and other, other matters, but there's a team of people working with Albert Einstein. People whose names you don't know. Many of whom probably worked harder than Albert Einstein. Many of whom, if we could quantify intelligence, are smarter than Albert Einstein. And courage, well, we don't know who they are, so hard to, hard to really think about that. Were they courageous? I don't know. Did any of them ever stand up to Einstein when he was wrong? Probably. Was that courageous? Yes. About the geniuses, and we can mention them right the way through history, Practically every one of those ideas was controversial, and in some time, and at some points, even it could have ended the life of the person who vocalized it. Uh, yeah, that that um, that surely is is correct. I think I was using genius, mm. you know, in a more narrow sense of someone who has just a very high IQ, mm -hmm. okay. which would, would probably be, you know, oh, of course, IQ, the sort of IQ mania. Silicon Valley perspective where, you know, people <laughs> talk, you know, Google tries to give people quasi IQ tests and these algorithm tests when they hire people. And, um, and, uh, and then, and so I do, I when do he says quasi IQ so. tests, these, so if you're, it depends on what you're doing at Google. If you do, if you're a coder, yeah, they're going to give you proficiency tests and uh, try to see if you can solve new problems quickly. And, and maybe, but maybe not, maybe your fucking reputation stands on its own because you've done good work. And there's other things that people do at Google. There's uh, human resources. There's all the different things that make a company work. N not very many of them. Well, IQ tests are fucking stupid in the first place. But not very many. Not everybody at Google is a coder. Some sense get people who are uh, very intelligent in, in, in some sort of definition, but uh, but um, end up being not very creative, not very impactful in, in all these other ways. And it's, it's quite strange. The, you know, the academia version of it would be, uh, you know, there was, there was a type that was already going extinct when I was in college in the 1980s, which I would describe sort of the, the um, maybe the brilliant but eccentric, the eccentric professor type who had, you know, was somewhat of a polymath, had ideas about a lot of different, different subjects. And, uh, and but that, that might also be like, like apocryphal, you know what I mean? You may remember the one nutty professor ec eclectic professor but the like m i bet most of the fucking most of the professors when he was at stanford were like boring all fuddy duddies right like has uh has has basically gone extinct whereas you, know, you probably still have a lot of people in academia still who uh would score reasonably highly on an iq test but and that's a very interesting point can you blame people for not having courage when they're incentivized to conform because you know we, we talk about google google don't want people challenging google don't want people who are you know so creative that they're difficult to control they want people to come in to do the job and then leave well uh you can you can um you know it's a, a, a great deal of this is surely done at the margins and so uh you know 
yeah, you, you, I'm not encouraging people to be foolhardy or to be martyrs or to be suicidal insane or anything like that like that but well but uh, okay yeah. that's good everybody thank thank goodness that peter Thiel doesn't want people to be what he calls suicidally insane did you know that peter Thiel doesn't want people to fucking eat themselves at, at the margin i think it would do a lot of good if people had just a little bit more courage in all of these cases there, there are probably ways you can you can blame people for um putting themselves into these contexts so if uh you know if someone goes into academia and thinks that they will, uh, they'll have this sort of creative intellectual career. Um, you know, at some point, uh, they should figure out that the pressures are enormous and, uh, militate against that in very powerful ways. And, but like the problem with this is the conformity he's talking about is conforming to like the rules, right? It's so weird, actually, the way that people talk about academia, they're like, oh, well, you know, they shouldn't why are we making rules for their employment? And it's like people who are like some, you know, some motherfucker right now is getting fired from a customer service job for not being cheery enough. And so like, I'm not going to really shed a tear for the academic who has to like, I don't know, follow the rules from the HR department on how to treat their colleagues or whatever, or has to follow some general kind of syllabus for the class they're teaching. So that the class, so that the, you know, the fucking, university can retain its accreditation or whatever i'm just not i just don't feel sorry for those people right now somebody at a dairy queen is being fired for something hell stupid and uh, you know they, they should try to figure out a way to do something creative outside of academia because they will not be able to do inside so so yes i think i think there's a way in which if you look at it locally it's always not your fault you know you're <laughs> yeah. going to google that day and mm. you, you, you know you don't want to cr create a hostile work environment or something by by articulating some heterodox view on gender relations or something like that. But then, what is a hetero? What do you see? Like, I would like it. What is an example of a heterodox view on gender relations that they would get you fired from Google? Is he talking about the Google memo where the, the dude just straight up said that women and minorities are dumb and shouldn't be coders? Is that what he's talking about? And, uh, if you, if you widen the aperture, I think, uh, you can blame people a little bit more for, you know, having, made dis the decisions to put themselves in these situations, not thinking about the social context enough and, uh, you know, having, having had the blinders on in some sense. Do you think that's one of the reasons why there's so many autistic people who go on and found big companies or in these huge level, um, entrepreneurs because they see the world in a different way and they're not as connected to wanting to be part of a group as much as neurotypical people are. Yeah, it's it's probably probably if someone's fully autistic, mm. the, the the probably are. There is no what is that the the term fully autistic doesn't really mean anything anymore. It's a very pretty broad spectrum, and I think he means less socialized, less socializable when he says fully fully autistic. I'm not a um I'm not an expert here, and I should probably probably keep my comments to a minimum here, so I don't end up saying something dumb. But I mean, come on. That's that's pretty not helpful in, in all sorts of ways, but uh, but yes, certainly there are probably people who are very mildly on the spectrum where where uh, it's it's strangely uh, been been helpful, and there probably are a number of people in tech where, where something like that is is true. Um, but then I, th I think this is this is not a pro Aspergers. <laughs> this, is, this is a this is a, this is so that's an antiquated term, and I am actually very pro uh, everybody like. I might be kind of a dick, but I'm actually pro people li living on the autism spectrum. I, I wouldn't, why would you want to be against them? They're just fucking people. This is, that, what the fuck is he talking about? Beyond, uh, wow, our society is really insane and deranged. Well, in a, in a, in a you know, in a, in a healthy society, uh, someone who'd, who had Asperger's would, would be a less functional person that would be able whoa. to get Whoa, letting it all hang out, are we, Peter? And uh, we must be just in an incredible social pressure cooker society where, you know, an average person with a pretty good social EQ just picks up on all these pressures and, uh, um, you know, uh, knows to censor and get rid of every heterodox idea they ever had. Mm. So uh, what is that? What, do you, what is he? 
this I, I don't think that i think we could add the heterodox to our list of words that doesn't fucking mean anything anymore because heterodox like it's just the opposite of the orthodoxy it doesn't necessarily mean like being contrarian it you the heterodox would necessarily in, include the orthodox opinion because it is just multiple doxy I'm gonna be, uh, i don't know the etymology of this word but it just sounds like it would include the consensus opinion plus and considerations for opinions outside of the consensus, which is fine. Well, very much on the point of society being deranged, I want to come back to the idea of the future. And I, I, I understand perfectly well what you say, making predictions, especially about the future is a bad idea, as they say. However, in your career, the thing that many people will know you for is making investments or making moves that were visionary. That's why that I introduced you the way I did. I wasn't sucking up to you. It's just an observation of your trajectory through life. So I would be- They don't know how venture capital works. Venture capital works. You take a lot of high risk. You go with a lot of high risk investments, sometimes even a low amount of like relatively low amount of money on high risk investments. You make a lot of them kind of scattershot and hope that one of them is a big fucking deal and that you can make a ton of money on it because of your equity in the company. The venture firms have like a low success rate. It's just that when it hits, they tend to make a lot of fucking money. Mind just finding out what you see coming down the pipe. And, and we're not going to say, you know, Peter Thiel in 2024 predicted this and now he's an idiot because it didn't happen. I guess we're just curious of what you might see as the things that are likely to occur. Well, I'm always I'm always extremely hesitant with um, the categories, the buzzwords. Mm. And uh, so, you know, if, if, if we, you know, and there's, there's, in Silicon Valley tends to, you know, traffic in, you know, mobile internet or cloud computing or big data machine learning, you know, the, the current one is AI, which, you know, which is for all intents and purposes, the same as machine learning and needs what we call the cloud and big data because it's fucking iterative. It's also bullshit and everybody's going to fucking lose all their money on it, which will be fun. But, um, like what this guy doesn't know shit. People have been overusing for a long time and has gone completely into, into overdrive and you know, as a, as a venture capitalist or investor, you know, I, I want to invest in successful businesses. And, uh, you know, I think, I think the, the really successful businesses, um, have to do something that's unique. You know, it's, uh, you know, uh, they have a moat or dare we, dare we say even a monopoly, um, you know, around, around the business, they're, they're doing something that, um, isn't just this commodified, uh, competition. And so, you know, they're, there, there are, and I always think of a, a restaurant as the uh, as the sort of paradigmatic example of a bad business. If you want, um, you know, if you want, you know, um, nature bared red and tooth and claw, uh, bloody competition, you should open a restaurant. And uh, I always, you know, my one heterodox idea I have is that competition and capitalism are opposites. In a competitive world, you compete away the profits and you do not accumulate uh, capital. Competition is for losers. You want to find, you want to find. Uh, oh shit! Somebody in chat just, uh, just pretty much fucking nailed it before Peter Thiel said it. Where you're doing something that's unique, you have a significant head start. You're so wait a minute. If we think of, of like the important, think about think about the largest uh, tech businesses. We got Google. Um, they did search. Did they invent search? Uh, no. The time Google was around, Yahoo was the big name in search. You got Facebook. Did Facebook invent search or invent social media? No. Uh, at the time Facebook came around, MySpace was the big name in social media. We got Amazon. Did Amazon invent e-commerce? No. When Amazon went all the way into e-commerce, eBay was the big name in e-commerce. Then Amazon actually makes a lot, a lot of their money on um, uh, AWS cloud computing. And other people were doing that. Uh, AD, AWS was uh, maybe maybe ahead of the game, but it was because they were using they had extra resources from their e-commerce business. Um, what other we got a uh, like Nvidia is huge, but they just recently became huge because like somebody in chat was saying they're kind of suckering all the people in, that are into AI into buying these chips. But 
NVIDIA was also not the first person, the first company to create graphics processing units. These are these businesses did not make anything new. They just didn't. Out of people. And so so I know on, on the technology side, I would I would I would say that I think the AI breakthroughs are important. They're going to they're going to have an enormous impact on our our society in in in, uh, in very different ways, uh, but um, as investments, they're very very treacherous at this point. And I, I think it's roughly I mean the the rough analogy is that AI in twenty twenty four is like the internet in nineteen ninety nine. It's clearly going to be important, big, transformative, have all kinds. No, of not really, because in nineteen ninety nine, even though that even though the there was a big market crash, uh, the internet was doing things that people liked. <laughs> Like, like even pets.com, which is the, like the one that everybody like kind of shits on, they were doing something that people, they were like selling people supplies for their pets. This was a thing that people wanted. The business model just didn't work, but this was people, this was shit that people wanted. Did, have, does anybody here want the things that a, that Sam Altman is telling us that AI is going to do? There's a big difference here. Social you know, political effects, maybe even effects about how humans think about themselves. Uh, but uh, on a business level, it's very, very treacherous because there were, you know, there were a lot of different internet businesses that failed and even the ones that succeeded, it was, you know, quite a roller coaster. You know, Amazon was the leading e-commerce site in 1999. It was $113 a share on the pre, on the pre-split adjusted basis on a, in terms of at the price at the time in December of 1999. By October of 2001, it was five and a half dollars. You know, you had to wait till the end of 2009 to get back to the 99 level. And then it went up, you know, it went up 25 X from there. So if you'd held it from December 99 to today, you would have made 25 times your money, but you would have first lost 95% and then- But you didn't lose the money if you held. That's the point of holding. If you hold the stock, you haven't lost the money because it's still invested. You lose the money when you sell it. Get the shot that what the fuck dude 100 500 times your money or so and um and so so in some sense amazon was was the obvious internet company to invest in and even that was you know quite quite a roller coaster and my, my suspicion no is with hindsight yeah. amazon would have been the obvious internet company to invest in i don't know what the obvious internet company in 1999 but fuck for all i know it was uh, comcast in 1990 like right it was the for all we know it was uh like it could, it's some, some company that we don't really think of as a big player might have been a big deal to invest in. But that's roughly where we are in AI. It's, uh, it's correct as a technology, but then, uh, you know, extremely uh, bubbly and crazed as a, you know, as a company building thing or as a, as a sector to invest. A lot of people are very concerned about AI from the perspective of the things that you mentioned, which is the impact it's going to make on human beings, the way we relate to each other, whether we have jobs to go to, which have been the source of me not just money, but meaning and purpose to a lot of people over time. Ooh, not necessarily. You can find meaning and purpose outside of your outside of your employment. And I hope that you do. Source of social connections where you meet, you might meet your spouse. I mean, the, 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 the things that people. Well, think the reason people meet happen. their, meet their spouse and find meaning at their job is because, you know, you have your job and you have home. And then we've the third places, we call them third places, essentially. Those are drying up. People don't go to the park. Nobody hangs out at the library. If you go out, you go to the bar, you go somewhere to spend money. Like, People aren't like meeting each other at like a book club or like it's, it's very different now. The third place has actually been replaced by fucking people like Peter Thiel. Like the third place where you might meet somebody is in here, right? It's a, a dating app and that's fine. I use them. I use them well. I'm quite popular on the, on the, on the one you probably think I'm popular on. Um, but the, this, this live Corey Pine's work, book, Live, Work, Work, Die. Well, where's the time for the third place? Where's the time to meet your spouse? Where's the time to make friends socialize? Where's the time for that other stuff? We got rid of it. Like during, there was a point where like people that worked at Apple were wearing shirts that said 90 hour work week and proud of it. Well, who, did that, that motherfucker have time to go date? 
happen as a result of AI could potentially transform humanity in a way that will be extraordinarily significant. Do you see that happening? Well, um, you know, I, I suppose there are uh, there are a range of dangers and risks. Um, there is, yeah, there are questions how it affects the labor market, whether is it fundamentally a complement to human labor that makes humans more productive, or, or is it a substitute for human labor where uh, human workers will get paid paid less at the end of the day? Uh, you know, most, you know, the history of the Industrial Revolution was that, uh, you know, most of the time the Luddites have been wrong. The machines, you know, didn't really replace people. But during the Industrial Revolution, like the <clears throat> factories were making things that people wanted. They weren't making like a picture of a person with nine fingers. <laughs> and like, they weren't giving you the wrong answers to simple questions. Together, they freed people up to do more productive things. And um, in some sense, increase the GDP per, per human being. And, uh, and my intuition is that that, se that seems like the far more likely outcome with these AI technologies that it is, which is you know, also what computers did. And you know, in some sense, what, you know, what has been happening since the Industrial Revolution. Um, I think there are, you know, there are complicated distributional questions. Will, will a lot of the gains be captured by a few big tech companies? Uh, if there are any, yes, but I think this might be a bit of a, this might be a bit of a schadenfreude for everybody. <clears throat> I think this, I think this shitting, I think eventually this, this shit's going to fucking crash and it's not going to crash like the dot, like the, the old internet business, the Amazon going to be fine. Facebook going to be fine. It's not going to take down the entire tech sector with it, but this whole shit's come coming crashing down. Cause it's the, even if it, even if it gets what five times better than it is now in the next five years nobody's making any fucking money on this you notice when like um, open ai releases stuff they talk about revenue they ain't telling you how much money they're losing that shit is burning money and now they're burning microsoft's money which is i don't know i guess good fuck microsoft but like google will be fine because they have so much money but like this is this is all gonna i think this is all gonna end I don't think that the, the research into this stuff will end, but I think this idea, this idea that it's like the next big uh, consumer product, the next revolution in technology and the next thing that's going to make fucking people rich. I think it's going to go the other way. I think s some of these people who have been like evangelists for it are going to end up as pariahs. Although I don't know, the history of Silicon Valley has taught us one thing. It's that I uh, ain't, ain't no place else where you can fail up like Silicon Valley. Be more, um, more evenly distributed in our society. I don't think people have particularly good models on that. And of course you have, you know, and then of course you have also uh, all these uh, scarier existential risks where, you know, maybe, I mean, you know, I, I, don't, I don't really believe the science fiction version where the AI becomes, you know, um, you know a superhuman godlike being and decides to destroy the world. Why not? Uh, I, I, th I think well before you get to that point, um, it can be weaponized by humans in a military use, which is probably also just as scary. And so um, you would- um, Yeah, but what, he, he, he says in Palantir, get the fuck out of here. All, so there are all sorts of- yeah, there are all sorts it's of scary, what the fuck? That are like, dangerous. Again, uh, Palantir. Dangerous. But I, I, yeah, look, I, I would concede that it is a, you know, it's a fairly, uh, there, are, there are some great dangers in the technology, and I understand why people are nervous or scared about it. Um, I, however, the the place where I do strongly come down on the opposite side of the precautionary principle and the effective altruists and the East Bay rationalists and the you know Eliezer Bostrom. Oh God, Cabal, the East Bay rationalists must be the most in, must be is uh, almost uh, insuffer as insufferable as Peter Thiel. What the fuck does he mean, East Bay rationalist? Uh, you know, if we if we talk about different you know different kinds of existential risk. In the world, you know, and the, you know, there's a nuclear war. There's the, uh, the the AI that kills everybody. Maybe dangerous biotech. Maybe uh, you know, um, maybe climate change or various types of um, environmental factors. And par parenthetically, it's always interesting that the, the people who talk about these things uh, are always just focused on their own one. So you can, you know, I always think there's a critique of someone like Greta, 
that she's insufficiently apocalyptic in her thinking because she's not worried about AI and she's not worried <laughs> about nuclear weapons. And then the AI people. He means Greta Thunberg. For a minute, I was like, why are you talking about Greta Van Susteren? Enough about climate change. And maybe we should get them all in a room and let, have them fight it out first. But uh, the existential risk that I always want to also put into the hopper, if, if, we, if we were to have a comprehensive discussion of these risks, is, um, is the risk of a totalitarian one world government. And I think. Uh, <laughs> And I think that get the fuck out of here. Like, wow. <laughs> oh no. Um, the answer, the implicit answer to so many of these existential risks is a totalitarian one world government. And so, you know, Gre no, no, that's just the, that's changes. just the nail. When, it, when you're a, when you're a hammer, everything is a totalitarian one world government nail. This dude spends way too much time with Eric Weinstein, I think. The biggest problem everybody should ride a bicycle i would submit that uh, the way you'd actually do this would be uh would be um you know going from the frying pan into the fire of of, of this and, and in what? a similar way if we um if we were to really regulate and and stop um ai from a precautionary principle you would need something like global compute governance or, or something like this um which uh would have to be pretty heavy handed because, you know, anyone can program a computer and it can be done on this very local level. So it has to be, you know, much more heavy handed than, you know, the international regulatory bodies that regulate, let's say, nuclear weapons proliferation, where, you know, it's, it's hard. Oh, no. Oh, God. Nuclear weapon. And so no. you don't need necessarily. Well, this, it, him and Sam Altman are friends. Uh, our tech podcast was supposed to come out today. It'll come out tomorrow, I suppose. Um, I think I talked about this. <laughs> Sam Altman saying that there needs to be a fucking like a something stronger than the IAEA or and similar to ICANN, but for um, for AI, and he had said that the the West needs to be in control of it or some fucking bullshit. A super um, heavy-handed one-world government to stop it. You, you would for AI, and so uh, a lot of it uh, has the. You know, has the character where I think that that risk is is much greater than um, you know the, the risk people. Somebody asked about. about Eric Weinstein leading a meeting at Teal Capital. You know, he is the Eric is the managing director at Teal Capital. Eric Weinstein, and uh, people, in case you're not aware, his big the big venture fund he's involved in is a uh, founders fund. Teal Capital is like his boutique firm. It's, it's his like for his like ego projects essentially. Teal, uh, founders fund is where most of this guy's money is is at and where most of his money comes from. But, and then if I, if I had to do the sort of the, I don't know, the, not sure the contrarian take or the, you know, if, if you held a gun to my head and said, which do I think we're going to get? Are we going to get, you know, this dangerous AI that disrupts our society and maybe, you know, becomes this dangerous weapon? Or are we, are we likely to get uh, the one world nanny state that uh, stops it from being built? Um, since people are worried about the former and not the latter, that tells you you should worry about the latter and not the former. Yeah, but the, the fucking, the, the fear of like, like a one world government, a new world order, it's like been an ever present fear. Like, but it, it hasn't happened. Hasn't happened. Like countries can barely hold themselves together. Like nations, nation states, as we know, like modern nation states are often in tenuous positions. How the fuck are we going to hold the whole world together? It's interesting you say that because you all know Harari, who's a very interesting thinker, who identifies many of the uh, global threats, the ones that you describe. He's open in terms of calling for global coordination in order well, to. Well, wait a minute. Global coordination is a lot different than a fucking dystopian one world government or a new world order. Now we're fucking, now we're doing the Mott and Bailey, right? <clears throat> Are we talking about a new world order, one world centrally controlled government, or are we just talking about international cooperation? Is your concern about that based on the fact that no one else is concerned about it, or are you saying you see steps being taken towards that outcome, the global government outcome? Uh, You've just heard Peter Thiel use propaganda. If your generic is precise, country and feel ground so do you and take a subscriber back to the news back to the news this is an interview with peter Thiel. this is not the news my, my intuitions are that a a true global government would be uh would be 
quite bad. It would be, it, it, uh, it would have a totalitarian character. It would have a character that there could be no escape from it. Um, well, to be why, fair, if there's a one world government and you can't leave the planet, yeah, I guess there's no escape from it. Classical liberal intuition would be that the marginal tax rates would um, be somewhere between 95 and 100 percent. So right. like the UK then. <laughs> you know, like, uh, yeah, which, if you could actually stop people from leaving the UK. Yeah. Right? With, with right. the, you know, what, uh, I don't know, what, um, what Corbyn would set the tax rates in the UK yeah. if, uh, if you could actually prevent people from leaving. But yeah. what or, I'm like asking East is, Germany, if you, yeah, you know, yeah, if you yeah. built a wall what to the stop fuck? people from leaving. But what I'm asking is, Peter, do you see things that are currently happening that are taking us in that direction? Do you see people, you know, coordinating in the shadows, so to speak, to make that world government a reality? Well, I think well, if they're coordinating in the shadows, the idea is that we don't see them. I think that is, I think in a way that is the the implicit answer to all these all these existential risk. Problems. Do you think that's why they're being talked about so much? Um, I, I, you know, I, th I think there are there are good there. Look, there always are true believers. They're useful idiots. There are uh, people who are in part of a racket. And so, you know, is, is environmentalism. But didn't you just describe like believe? the people you hang out with? You've got the true believers, you got the useful idiots and you got the people that are part of a racket. Um, I'm pretty sure the trigonometry people are part of a racket. I think Eric Weinstein is a true believer. And like useful idiots are probably like people like Jimmy Dore, Dave Rubin. I believe it's a problem. Yes. Are there people who are useful idiots and uh, just tools for others' agendas? Yes. And are there people who are part of a corrupt racket? Yes. It's, and it's always, these things always have elements of all three. If it was, if we could just collapse it to one of them, they uh, they wouldn't be as 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 powerful as as they are. But I think, um, but yes, I my 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 sense for it is that uh, you know a number of these things, the the implicit answers uh, require this sort of uh, supranational coordination in a in a very. Deep but again, way. super supranational coordination is different than one world totalitarian government like coordination is like like the united states even coordinates on things with with the with their adversaries uh, somebody mentioned the iss earlier we, the united states coordinates with the, the the adversaries with adversaries of the united states for to work on the iss there are many things like the the scientific community peer review scientific discovery oftentimes cross. In fact, it almost necessarily has to cross inter, international borders. And the, and then my sort of political philosophy uh, sense is that that kind of coordination, um, you know, would it would it would be very non democratic. You'd have you know you'd be deferring even more to experts, even more um, even more to. Um, you know, extremely large centralized uh, structures. So it would be very non-democratic, very bureaucratic, uh, probably fairly high tax. It's, it's, you know, in some ways the, the kind of transformation that you've had in the, you know, as, um, as Europe has turned into the EU. You know, it was, in some ways the, the common market was envisioned in, you know, in 1979 by, by Thatcher when she, when she was pro-EU in 1979. Because it would be, you know, you'd have this level playing field, and you'd have, you'd have this this market, and it would be a way to, to weaken the unions and all these things. And it would, it would sort of be push things in a more capitalist direction. But then, as um, you know, as the as the common market got created, it came with you know this bureaucracy in Brussels that regulated the size of bananas and everything else you could think. Did of. it regulate that? I don't think you can actually like listen. There's there's things that government regulation cannot. You cannot regulate the size of bananas. <laughs> like the fucking. The bananas are going to grow whatever size they're going to grow. And uh, that's not in the Econ 1 textbooks, that you have free trade. The trade always comes with um, a supranational bureaucracy that regulates it and standardizes and things like this. And, and uh, yeah, my, my judgment is that uh, that trade-off uh, would be, uh, you know, maybe it's still okay on the level of Europe because, you know, one can still leave, one can still leave Europe. Um, but uh, on the level of the world, uh, it would be quite another matter. Are you optimistic, Peter, about the future of the United States? Or are you one of those people who looks at it now and sees a sp that we're in a period of steady decline? 
I am, I always, I always dislike the, uh, you know, frames of extreme optimism or mm -hmm. extreme pessimism. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, in, in some ways, you know, my question about the future, you know, the, maybe the place where I would dis should disagree with the whole premise of your question is, it's not like the future is, um, you know, written mm -hmm. out there somewhere. And it is uh, that all we have to do is, you know, sit back and eat some popcorn and watch the movie of the future unfold. Mm. Um, you know, well, that's my, sort of what the QAnon people were saying. My bias, it always comes down to individuals or small teams of people and that the question of agency is extremely important. And, you know, and we get to decide in part what kind of a future we want to build. And, uh, and, and if you, if you are extremely optimistic or extremely pessimistic, I think, um, they, they both, uh, end up, uh, both of those attitudes lead to, um, lead to a kind of, um, you know, lead to a kind of, uh, passivity, extreme pessimism. There's nothing that can be done. Extreme optimism. There's nothing that needs to be done. And so I think of both of them as sort of, uh, code words or euphemisms for sloth and laziness. What? In practice, um, and so if, but what? Okay, you know, extreme pessimism probably leads to like defeatism and whatnot. But extreme optimism—you could be extremely optimistic. I could see being very optimistic about the future and wanting to be a part of it and wanting to like work to be part of this future that you're optimistic about. What the fuck is he talking about? Probably a healthier. Attitude is I could even see moderate. being pessimistic about the future and working really hard to prevent what you think is the fucking what you think the horrible thing that's coming might be. That's sort of how I feel like what we and our friends uh, here in the dystopia beat are doing to varying degrees of uh, success. Optimism, you know, moderate pessimism, where you know at the margins, um, you know, a, a lot can be done. So with that, you know, big qual qualifier. Uh, yes, I you know there are all sorts of places where one can have very serious concerns about the United States, uh, you know, th the deficits are out of control. There's sort of all sorts of um, things that seem to be on a deeply unsustainable trajectory. Uh, the, the thing that I think is very paradoxical about it is uh, that, you know, maybe we have absolute stagnation or even maybe even decline. Um, but on a relative sense, there's just this felt outperformance. And I, I've started to wonder whether the, you know, the absolute crisis and the relative outperformance are somehow very deeply linked. Because um, if someone uh, who, you know, so, is somewhat pessimistic lists all these places where the US has very deep problems, the rebuttal from people like you coming from the UK um, will always be something, well, would you want to move to the UK? Or where <laughs> would you want to go? I would be fine. I would probably do just fine in the uk i'd pay more taxes sure but i'd get more you get more from the government in the uk like the healthcare, particularly like people probably bitch about the nhs but i don't know like it seems to work fine for most of the people there and they don't they don't be overthrowing the government and um and then they didn't even hard. try on january 6th to answer and somehow maybe 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 it's a yeah it's a there are these problems in the U.S., and it's it's coupled with the sense that there are um, there are really uh, no other places that are doing better at all, or that these that uh, the problems are maybe even more acute. And you know, the, but doing the better on by what metric? What do you mean, doing better by what metric? <clears throat> like, if you think about like who are the happiest people in the world? It's like Northern Europeans generally are the happiest people in the world because they have the <clears throat> They have the least to worry about. Like you, you fall on your face there. You're probably not going to be homeless, and you're going to have health care. There's strong so social safety nets, and the economies there are pretty strong. And like the other, <clears throat> the other thing that sort of flies in the face of what he's saying here is Germany. Germany has like union representation on the boards of medium and large companies, and they have a strong social safety net, and they have a very strong economy. And they've also managed not to start World War III so far. So, so far, so good in the, in the post-war era for Germany. This is more acute in Europe or the, um, the sort of tech stagnation is even more felt. We, we at least have still have the tech piece, the, you know, the, the IT computer piece is still working in the United States. So Peter, 
what are the things that you would change about this country in order to make it more effective, work better? And I think one of the things that we can all agree on is tackling that deficit because I'm no economist and I'm not a numbers guy, but I look at the numbers and I'm like, I'm pretty worried. Well, it's always, you know, um, yeah, in, in theory that if you could wave, wave a magic wand, there are all kinds of things uh, you would, one would try to do. Uh, my, um, you know, probably my, my policy intuitions are, are still broadly quite libertarian in terms of what one should do. And so um, I think, I still think there is a lot that uh, one could do by deregulating, having, you know, a less severely regulated economy. Deregulate what? This motherfucker, he's in it. <laughs> you think this guy would want to want to have his office in a building where there were no building codes? Everything from, you know, the zoning laws here in Los Angeles. You know, if you look out, you look out the window, we have all these skyscrapers. You do not, you don't, you don't see a single construction crane. Mm. And that, well, you know, that but, tells but, you. Okay. That's because the skyscrapers already there. That tells you something about, um, you know, an, an incredibly, you know, bad, uh, regulatory regime where yeah but does, does this guy want even a three-story fucking apartment building in his neighborhood wherever the fuck he lives like this guy's probably got a fucking one or two story gigantic house in a place where there where it would be illegal to put up a fucking four-story apartment building and he probably likes it that way um it, it's very very hard very expensive to build uh to build new buildings um and and there's, um, and, and so I, yeah, my intuition would still be that there's you know, a lot that one can do on the regulatory side. Um, you know, I think, I think the, the answer that the left has is that you have to raise taxes like crazy. I, I don't think that's the one we, we should try to do. Um, it's but on whom? Raise taxes on you? Right? I ain't rolling in the dough. I don't even, I don't know too many leftists who'd be like, you know, who's not paying enough taxes? Uh, Twitch streamers who are barely scraping by on the uh, largesse of their, uh, of their community, of the community that supports them. Or, you know, who should probably pay more taxes? That teacher. You know what I'm saying? Like he, this is, this is really dumb. This is really dumb. But also let's say that, let's say that uh, we, we somehow, some way get to a single payer healthcare system in this, in this country. Well, yeah, my taxes are going to go up a little bit, but I'm going to get something for that. The Republicans probably don't have a great answer to this right now. And, and I think their, their <laughs> implicit answers, we're just going to keep borrowing money, um, ind indefinitely. And, um, I, I worry that that's not going to be adequate at the end of the day. And, we will eventually get sort of a, uh, you know, a um, a very big move to the left if we if we don't figure out some way to get back to growth. Mm. But, can but, I, but can wait I a minute, start? infinite. Aren't these people also the ones who are saying that? Oh, it, oh okay, infinite growth. It, it like ties in with their weird birth rate shit, right? Because this idea that we have to keep growing, like, why? Why did we? Why did? Why is capitalism set up in such a way? That if you have a couple years where maybe your economy doesn't grow, you know, for this reason or that reason, where it's like a fucking calamity and a disaster for everybody. Why? Who the fuck set that up that way? I mean, I know who set that up that way. It's the fucking the people with the power. And in this case, the power is the money. But that's fucking that's really dumb and really tenuous for regular people. I don't want to rely on the fucking economy growing every year so that I can fucking, I don't know, go out to dinner every once in a while. That's fucking crazy town. Ask on, on this point, I've been wondering later, Peter, and feel, obviously you feel free to disagree with me entirely, but it seems to me people often talk about political polarization, and it's tangible, of course, in both our countries. But the one thing that I'm wondering is, is the inability to deal with the deficit a reflection of that polarization? In other words, if you were running a small company and you had 40 employees, let's say, and you hit tough times... And you said to all your employees, guys, look, in order for us to survive as a business and for all of us to keep our jobs, we all got to take a 10% pay cut. You're going to get less money. I'm going to get less money. You're going to have less money to spend on your family. Well, that's the thing is if your employees are organized, the first question is, well, actually, how much money are you making right now? 
<laughs> right? Like, what is what is your paycheck going to look like when you take ten percent off the top? Looks like a nice new fucking car. You're going to have to sell that car, friend. Heard you bought another condo. You're going to have to sell that. Oh, you're not. Hmm. That's interesting. You're going to have less money for social benefits. You're going to have less money for healthcare. But that's how we're going to make it as we're a team. That works if you feel that you're one team. But if you've got a society in which half the country suspicious and hateful, you might argue, of the other, that seems to me to be the position where you might struggle to tackle something like effectively the, what we're doing is spending more money than we have, right? Yes. Do you think that these things are connected? They are somehow connected, but probably the causation is very different from the way uh, you're articulating it. So hmm. I, the way I would articulate it is that um, maybe um, a sort of representative democracy, sort of a constitutional Republican government of the sort the U.S. has, um, it always works. You know, you have a lot of checks and balances. The decision-making process isn't fast. It's, it, you know, it, it, it requires a lot of... Well, it depends. The decision-making process in America has been pretty fast if we want to drop bombs on somebody. Compromises to, to make decisions. And, um, and perhaps it works that best ain't free. when you have um, a lot of growth going on in the background. And so if you have an ever-growing pie, then, you know, there's always some question, how do you divide up this, this growing pie? Um, and if you're like a very difficult, obnoxious uh, political actor, um, uh, you don't get a bigger piece of the pie for yourself. And th that sort of a person doesn't do well. Um, but then if the pie is, is not growing and it becomes this very uh, brutal zero-sum thing where there's a winner for every loser or something like that, you know, I, I would expect. Um, I think the for to have. <clears throat> for every Peter Thiel, though, there's probably thousands of people who don't have anywhere to sleep tonight. I don't think it's one to one. I think it's like by. <clears throat> I don't think just like given the the rich uh, haircut's going to solve all the problems, but like it's not a one to one actually. You know, much nastier. Like this sort of speaker, uh, which I think it's a speaker that's but sitting here behind this couch. That's probably. That speaker's probably more than a, a, a month of my rent, possibly more than a year of my rent. But so, so I probably don't even sound know, my, that good. You know, you know, sort of a man with a hammer sees a nail everywhere, but I, I would say that the, the sort of- Well, no, no, like a, a that's a carpenter. <laughs> like, well, I don't know anybody could have a hammer, but I'm supposing he means like a carpenter and a carpenter probably doesn't just fucking say, well, we're gonna fix everything with nails. Relative stagnation that we've had um, you know, I, I think of the polarized and nasty politics as as downstream from that, and then you know, and then probably, you know, the the kind of bad compromise you always end up with, and and that is, well, we just keep borrowing money because that way, you know, we can sort of pretend that we have growth, and mm -hmm. uh, the future will will take care of it, even though it obviously won't if if you if the growth doesn't arrive, because it all comes down to a weakness of leadership, in my opinion, Peter, in that. We are a society that seeks comfort and everything. <laughs> That's a thing. crazy thing to say in the office that he's in. We are a society that seeks comfort. Well, it looks like somebody spent a lot of money on that fucking office and it don't really look like that comfortable a place to be. A lot of fucking white walls. Like, yikes. We a very sterile, very unwelcoming environment, actually. That table's probably 20 grand and you probably can't even stand on it been tailored to our own comfort. So why are our politicians going to make us feel discomfort? And that discomfort that we feel is just going to make, is going to be even more shocking because we've done our, we've spent our whole lives avoiding it. Yeah, there, surely there are, there are elements of all of these, these things that are correct. Uh, uh, but uh, it's, you know, it is, it is, it is sort of unclear what kind of leadership one is likely to get in a you know, in a deeply stagnant zero sum world. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's likely to be, um, you know, very polarized and not very charismatic. And, and, and also really just really easy to say where if we took 90% of this guy's net worth, he wouldn't, wouldn't be uncomfortable. He'd think that it was the fucking Cuban missile crisis and shit, but he wouldn't be uncomfortable. Very unifying. Mm. So Peter, um, 
that being the case, it w effectively feels like every rock we lift with you, stagnation is under it. Is there a way for for our... I, it, it almost doesn't feel like you're just talking about the West. You're talking about the entire world, really, at this point, right? Is that fair? It's... You know, there's a, there's a way that the crisis takes. Like I have different thoughts on uh, what we call the global South. Would you like to hear them? Forms, um, but I, yeah, I, would, I would say in the um, the developed countries, I always think um, the progress requires us to do new things, and and so it. Um, mm. If the younger generation will do better than their parents, uh, we have to have some kind of innovation. There, you know, there there may be other ways. But to do it. My generation, Gen X, is the first where that fucking that shit that shit pretty much sailed. And, you know, we were, we were, I was born in 1977. That was right after fucking taxes. They started cutting taxes on the richest of the rich. But, uh, but technology, I think is, uh, is this incredibly technological progress, scientific progress are these incredibly vectors for uh, the developed world you know, for the developing world. Um, there probably is some kind of globalization story where, you know, China maybe does not need to invent anything new if they just copy or steal or whatever all the intellectual no they're doing all the work i don't i don't mean like it's not i'm not okay that's that's the wrong way to say it um they're doing all the manufacturing they're making everything i don't know if you're making it are you stealing the fucking idea if, if, if people here are like oh we have this idea but boy howdy do we want you to make it i'm not even sure that's stealing like you send them the plans, be like, keep these a secret. They're like, sure, buddy. Sure. Property from the West. Maybe they can just catch up to our, to our living standards. And, uh, and then we can get into questions, you know, whether, whether, um, globalization without technology can work or how well that's going to work. But there, there is, there seems to be, there's some kind of globalization convergence story that one can tell for, um, you know, the, um, the, the less developed countries. But I always think, uh, yeah, if we divide the world, you know, and, and, and again, if we went back to the 50s and 60s, you would have divided the world into the first world and the third world. The first world was the part that was technologically advancing. The third world was just sort of messed up and stuck. So it was a pro-tech uh, story, but a non-globalizing thing. They were just these separate. But it was worlds. also, it was almost primarily divided by like, <clears throat> were there white people in your country? And now we divide it into the- That's uh, not a coincidence. And developing worlds which is um, yeah, a pro-globalization it's, it's, it's the the fallout from fucking colonization. Because the story of convergence, the developing countries will become developed, but then it's also uh, implicitly a story of stagnation where the developed world is that which is done, finished, there's nothing more to do, we are developed. And so, yeah, so the, the kind of, I don't know, if, if you wanted, I don't know, a, a slogan or something would be something like, you know, how, how do we, um, um, there was also like a we, second world, right? Like there wasn't just a first and a third world. Like I think, and I could, I could be totally, I could be totally off base here, but I think during that time, Mexico would have been called like a second world country. Um, the Soviet Union, according to people here, would have probably, we would have probably called that the second world. Start developing again. How do we have progress in the so-called developed world? How do we move beyond the de so-called developed world? Which right. Is always... You know, it's, it sounds good, but it's actually this very pessimistic description of, of where we are. Well, we don't know what a woman is, and th we're told. <laughs> oh, get progress. the fuck out of here! Boo, boo! Here, actually, we'll give Constantine the laugh he deserves on his only joke. <laughs> but in terms of actual progress, isn't isn't AI the answer here? It boosts our productivity minimum, as you say, if not just takes over and makes everything free of charge effectively. Isn't that how we get out of this? Is that possible? Uh, no, no, because now who owns the AI? And, and I don't know, are they just going to kick me down some money because they feel like it? Um, well, I, I, I certainly think it, it can help and it's something that should be, that should be pushed. But this is again where I, I, I would come back to the... Um, the um, the internet circa 1999, which mm. um, you know it led to a lot of great companies. Um, it uh, it probably did increase the GDP, you know, some. It did increase productivity some, but what? Um, it, you know, the, it, it, it 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 it's so much of the U.S. GDP is these technology companies and the <clears throat> second order companies. Like without, <clears throat> does this guy think? 
for example, Intel would be the behemoth it, it is, if not for the internet and people needing, uh, like, compute for their data centers? Like, what the fuck? The, in, in the sense, when that, this was the only new thing that really happened in the last quarter century, um, it, it, it probably was not enough to, you know, transform the living standards. We had, we had this manifesto we wrote uh, for my venture fund back in 2011 where we had the tagline, you know, they, they promised us flying cars and all we got was 140 characters. And, uh, <laughs> and it was not meant, you know, it, it was, you know, in some ways there's all these ways you can make fun of Twitter or I guess uh, now, now X and, uh, you know, where, uh, but, but it, it worked on the level of a business, right? It was you know, a few thousand people. They had very cushy jobs. Um, they could work from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. and smoke marijuana at the office or whatever they were doing. And so it, it, it worked on the level of the business, but it wasn't necessarily enough to, you know, increase living standards across the board for our society. And then that's, you know, that, that I, I, my sort of placeholder would be that AI is something like the internet. It will, you know, yeah, there are all sorts of places where you can, you know, wring efficiencies out of the system. Um, but uh, but I, I don't know if it will be as um, as economically transformative. And you mentioned as, as, as we need. You mentioned social media. Um, I think a lot of people. Well, I'm certainly one of them. Rather than saying a lot of people, I'll say I am concerned about the impact social media is having on our brains. Uh, yeah, but that's your part. I'm concerned about the fucking impact that shows like trigonometry are having on the brains of uh, mostly uh, men. Men, men, mostly men in my age cohort, I think. Uh, not only young people, but the way we relate to each other. And increasingly, um, I see with younger generations, we've had numerous people on the show where, from younger generations where it's clear. We all know, because we grew up without the internet, that most of the way the conversations are had online is bullshit. But younger generations don't. Um, are you worried about what social media is doing to us? You know, I, I always think it's too easy to turn social media or mm. various other Silicon Valley uh, tech companies into into the scapegoats for all of our problems. And uh, But sure. you're not even, even you're, first of all, the question's kind of weird, but you're not even answering the question. He didn't say that Constantine's question was, wasn't, is social media the cause of all of our problems? Really the, the bigger problem, you know, maybe... You know, the, surely the bigger problems are things like um, the failure of, of the schools, the wokeness of, you know, K through 12 schools. Oh, no. The uh, derangements of the universities. There's, there's something that's gone really haywire on the educational thing. Um, and then there probably are, there are ways in which... Um, yeah, you know, I, I think a lot of younger people don't know what they should be doing with their lives. Uh, and this, and this again, would be uh, yes, more, more the yes, stagnation. Yes, uh, the good old days when he was coming up. Famously, young people knew exactly what they were going to do with their lives. There was never, there were never almost, like, there were never almost every song <laughs> by the youth culture. <laughs> then that you were, um, spending Remember that, much time on that, that song, There Ain't No Cure for the Summertime Blues? That was... Just a couple of years ago, actually, on on TikTok or, or something like this, um, and you know uh, there are things I I, do, I don't like I don't like all these things that push us towards conformity. I think you know the critique of social media that I would the political critique I would have would not be that it's polarizing our society, but actually that it's homogenizing our society. Um, there's there's less heterodox thinking, but uh, but again, if if you think of it as a complement or alternative to the mainstream media, um, we probably ha still have a wider range of ideas that you can explore on the internet than you could before. So, uh, so yeah, there's probably, I don't know, there's something probably wrong with radio and television and, mm -hmm. and all these forms of media also, you know, in some ways made people dumb. In some ways, uh, you know, people oh, the printing press all the time. You know, the, the, you have some downtime, some entertainment. And uh, if you, if you, if you think of it as a, you know, is it, is it really, is it really, worse than television was for people. <laughs> it's an interesting point. I mean, so people would actually argue that social media is a pipeline. I mean, if you think that wokeness, let's compare it to a virus, I mean, that's the standard. Wait, why? Wait, uh, what, what, why are we going to compare it to a virus? Why are we going to compare what you call wokeness to a virus? 
it, it, it's really the the, the the it's how it's how it transmitted really into everybody's brain. It started at the university, and then it went what into leaked to, out of the yeah, lab. Yeah, yeah, it leaked out of the lab into Twitter, into Facebook. It leaked into out of the Instagram. lab. What is he talking about? Activism. Universities were involved in activism. Uh, we'll call it, we'll call it a, a, a social justice even. University students were involved in social justice activism, but it didn't come from there. It didn't come from the university. Graham, and that's when it started to proliferate. Yeah, but I, I, um, I, st I, I, I still think that was not. Again, we can. It's very hard to know these these, yeah. these cultural arguments, but I don't know. I, I, I'd be open to sort of a religious interpretation that it's, um, it is, you know, it is. Uh, Christ Christianity, the you know the main religion of the Western world, uh, you know, it, it always takes the side of the victim, and uh, and there's something where um, it is like some kind of deformation or intensification, and maybe you should think of wokeness as ultra Christianity or hyper Christianity. It's uh, it's just well, no, we, you, you could call. I mean, then by that we could call it a fucking. We call it fundamentalist Buddhism, I suppose. Then too, start and, uh, putting words together. You know, say anything. No forgiveness, and so it's sort of uh, it's uh, it's it's you still have original sin, and you have all these bad things that happened in the past. The past is terrible, and you can never overcome it. But uh, but there's there surely is a religious interpretation that this is sort of you know what 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 happened is um, as let's say the church lost a certain amount of authority, but people didn't become you know rationalist atheist people. They uh, they. Uh, they they went into the sort of uh, woke uh, religion, which they didn't become rationalist atheist people. anybody anybody here familiar with what happened to the atheist and skeptic community? They all fucking they all joined Gamergate. I mean, not all of them, but a good number of the very popular people in like new atheism. The thing he's probably talking about uh, ended up fucking screaming about Zoe Quinn and uh, and Anita Sarkeesian. Because, you know, rational things, you know, has to be interpreted, which I would interpret as, as, you know, a, a certain, you know, extreme form of Christianity. Yeah, it, because, you so know, there's, the a, new there's a religious interpretation. There's, yeah. you know, there's an economic one that, mm. you know, it's, mm. uh, there's a, um, there is a, uh, there is a, uh, there's an educational one. And then, you know, there's obviously some technology piece, but, uh, but that was, you know, it, I don't know, it was probably channeled by, you know, I think, I think. The liberal, the, the the bad liberal idea has been channeled by Hollywood for decades. Mm. Mm. What and were those? Because it's it's an interesting point about the you know like you were saying about the bad Hollywood ideas. Because it it seems to me that we were sold a lie with with the whole new atheism movement, where it was kind of said we don't need religion anymore because we have rationality, we have science, we have facts, science, rationality, and facts. I mean, great but they're not going to fill that particular part of you that needs filling that religion does so beautifully. Yeah, that's what grinders for. Well, it you know, it's it's all, oh, not the religion yeah. part. I, I I was confused actually, sorry. I I always I always think one should try to steal man. So there are all these things I disagree with the the new disagree disagreed with the new atheist song. But if I had to steal man, new atheism circa 2005. Um, you know, I think it was a very politically correct way to be anti-Muslim. <laughs> sort of, sort of oh out. shit! I actually agree with Peter Thiel. Yes, I actually agree with that. A lot of the PI, yeah, a lot of it was just like after nine eleven. They're like, ah, oh, you see, the fucking people with the wrong imaginary friend did that. All these religions together: Judaism, Christianity, yeah. Islam, a bunch of others. And then uh, they're violent and intolerant, and they just randomly kill people. And um, and it was a problem with Islam, or maybe fundamentalist Islam, or or, or so something like this. It was sort of a politically correct way um, to be and uh, to be opposed to that. And th there was surely some some need for that. Maybe there still is today. If you look at you know um, you know the um, the sort of uh, I don't know. Um, murderous insanity of the Hamas uh, people in Gaza and things like that. Um, Ooh, I mean, sure, yeah. I mean, we we're, we're no we're no Hamas stands here, but there seems to be like seems to be like murderous insanity to go around. 
uh, much of it actually right now coming from a, a nuclear superpower who pretends they're not a nuclear superpower. Um, and then, um, and then the, um, the sort of geopolitical way in which it lost its way is at some point, um, you know, the crisis, the, the, the danger to the West is surely more uh, from communist China than it is from, um, you know, um, medieval Islam or something like this. And, uh, and I think the new atheists did not have anything to say about I think the um, problem with new atheism, honestly, is you went to the com you went to the conferences and <clears throat> a lot of fucking, a lot of dudes, just a lot of dudes, like a lot, a lot of dudes, a lot of dudes. And a lot of them were kind of grabby for the v very few women who were there. So like where you go to a real estate conference, you know why people go to the real estate conference? I mean, they want to go to the real estate conference, but they go there to like fucking cheat on their husbands or their wives and shit. Let's not get it twisted. People be fucking at conferences. Uh, atheist conferences, 2005 to 2010, ain't nobody getting laid because there weren't a lot of gay pe gay guys there and there certainly weren't a lot of women there and there were a lot of straight dudes there. And I think that's the problem, actually, is that nobody was fucking. It's China, which is, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a consensus theory of truth. It's a, you know, it's, it's a social theory of truth. It's the wisdom of crowds or the wisdom of the Communist Party, which somehow distills the, the collective. It, is, uh, it claims to be scientific. You know, it's probably not, but of course the word science always gets misused. It's almost always whenever people use the word science, it's almost always a tell that it's not science. Wait, what? It's, you know, we, we don't call it physical science or chemical science, um, but it's social science, political science, climate science. So it's, you know, so <laughs> that's I, 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 climate science is a physical science. Like political science obviously is not the same. I mean, I'm, in favor yeah. of, I'm in favor of science, but I'm not in favor of uh, people using the word science most of the time. Yeah. Wait, why? Oh, yeah. I it's mean, I don't use it. Scientific socialism and uh, <laughs> the new atheists were 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 um, you know they they were they were good at um, you know um, explaining why Bin Laden was a bad person. They were a lot weaker when it came to Xi Jinping thought. Because, but by the time Xi Jinping, Xi Jinping was even part of the national lexicon, the uh, what we knew as the New Atheist Movement had fucking scattered off with a lot of them joining the fucking men's rights movement and shit. And the progressive part of that, the people who were more progressive in that, stopped like leaning in so much to like atheism and skepticism because fucking started to fuck that, especially like skepticism, like YouTube skeptic. Now it doesn't mean someone on YouTube who is like, show me the money. YouTube skeptic, we know what that means. That means like a fucking skull measuring asshole. What the New Atheists did is they took away the idea of religion. The flaw with the New Atheists is they didn't really know how to replace it. And what you created was a vacuum and something is going to fill a vacuum. Oh, uh, no, when it fell apart, like a lot of people did replace it with Gamergate. It fell apart and fucking a lot of those people, like, where the fuck did TJ Kirk go after that? The fucking amazing, well, less than amazing atheist. Fucking Michael Shermer, what did he do? Oh, we got handsy. Fucking ended up fucking, ended up running to Sargon of Akkad, another Gamergate figure, after he got all fucking handsy and people started talking about it. <clears throat> what about uh, the David Silverman of uh, American Atheist once he got caught for being, uh, you know, an alleged fucking sex pest? Well, he, he went running to the fucking men's rights activists, too. It seems like all the fucking chuds and idiots in the atheist and skeptic movement, once anything fucking didn't go their way, they ran directly into the arms of the men's rights activist movement, which, you know, I, my, you know, my take is that the MRAs, Gamergate, that that sort of ended up becoming the alt-right. And that's where those people ended up. And then th after that, like the fucking so-called IDW formed out of like the remnants of that, the people who didn't go like full fucking Stefan Mollen, you ended up following, following, uh, going like joining or being like IDW adjacent. But that's, that's just fucking how the, that's just how the, I don't believe in God cookie crumbles. Yeah. I mean, there's sort of a lot of different levels. I, 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 I sort of, I, I, I don't really like going as much as you're going into the sort of uh, yeah. spiritual, moral, yep, meaning of life, life direction. Uh, uh, I, I think it's, if you say it's a, a critique of things, that, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's, it's a critique of societies that are organized in a certain way. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think it was important to have a critique of a medieval Islamic society. That, that was 
that, 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 that there were a lot. I of mean, I have all kinds of critiques of medieval society more broadly. They didn't have modern medicine. <laughs> like women didn't have rights. I don't know. They burnt. They, they fucking executed people for no good reason. But I don't think he, I think he means just modern Islam as if this is fucking like all these medieval, like as if it's like, as if they're just like pre, pre, pre pre-modern monsters. Not desirable about that. Um, I think it is perhaps equally important to have a critique of a totalitarian communist society. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that in my judgment, that is a greater threat. And, um, well, just because, and, that's, well, and, that's and to be where, fair, uh, I mean, it, it, China, the, China has a lot of economic power and their, their military ain't no slouch either. So, I mean, sure, if you're, if you're like an ultra nationalist and worried about like America's interests, not just like us being safe, but us being like the dominant force on the planet, because you think that like, that's good for some reason. Well then, yeah, it's more, China's more concerning than Saudi Arabia or the entire region at this time. That's based on the premise that it's important that America and Europe are like supreme on the planet. And I, I'm not sure that well, I'm not is that good. I don't know. Might not be. Something about the methodology and the approaches, you know, they they weren't able to say. Yeah. And so, yes, you know, maybe, maybe uh, religion sometimes brings very bad things out of people. And we should find a way to criticize religion when it does does that. Uh, but the the notion that only religion brings bad things out of people, you know, may- maybe you could have defend this in 1780 before the French revolution, but, but sure, why? Sure, that's no, been, I don't think that's been even like the dumbest, <clears throat> most like tunnel vision <clears throat> atheist in 2008 or whatever. I don't think they would have said everything bad in the world comes from religion. Oh, never mind. Actually, you could have probably found that guy at, at, at that fucking the amazing meeting or whatever. <laughs> Actually. Yeah. You could have found, and I do mean guy dates in 1789 right well it's interesting that you mention um how you see comparatively the threat of communist china and the threat of islam because uh as i'm sure you're well aware uh, certainly in europe particularly on the right the concern about the demographic dimension of that the concern about the fact that european societies are failing to integrate their muslim populations well certainly less well than the united states is now giving rise to very strong sentiments about immigration generally, but about Muslim immigration in particular. And a lot of people in Europe would say, actually, you know, Muslim terrorists are way more likely to have a a immaterial impact on my life or a grooming gang in England or or whatever. What? Versus communist China way far off in the distance that's not really affecting me personally. How do you see those two threats and why do you say you're more concerned about China? Yeah, well, look, the... um, there probably are, are ways that one has to be able to talk about more than one thing at a time. Yeah. Uh, but uh, and I, I, there, there, yeah, there, there probably are all sorts of things that uh, where people were, you know, too cavalier about these things. Uh, you know, the, 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 the number, the number the demographic number that I've, I've seen um, is, and it, it is, if you look at continental Europe, so not the UK and not uh, not Russia, Soviet Union, but um, in 1930 uh, had something like 10 million Jewish people and something like 5 million Muslims, mostly like in, in the Balkans. And uh, today it's something like uh, maybe less than 2 million Jewish people. Uh, so there's a Holocaust and then a lot of Jews left. Uh, and something like 50 million Muslims. And so the ratio of Jews to Muslims went from twice as many Jews to 25 times as many Muslims, you know, okay. less than 100 years later. And if you have a 50 to 1 demographic change, surely that's, that's something, you know, one, um, one, one, one should have thought about and what that, what that meant. And then people were, you know, too cavalier about it doesn't matter because the education institutions work great and pe- pe- all these people will become, you know, um, modern liberals and productive members of our society. And so it was, it was yeah, there were, there were demographic questions people didn't want to talk about. There were educational things people didn't want to talk about. And they, they were, they were, they were all linked to the, uh, the, you know, the, the, the way I see the China one is um, sort of qualitatively quite different is that it is, you know, it is in some 
it is in some zero sum, you know, it is, it is determined to beat the West, to catch up to the West in these you know, questions of science and technology, and then, uh, and then what? You know, in some ways, uh, to you know, exert some some leverage through that where where it can you know it can dominate the planet. And uh, why do you say that, Peter? What's your evidence for that? You're you, you're someone in in the public space who seems to be uniquely vocal about this. Why? Are you uh, yes, so no one in the public space is telling you to be afraid of the influence of China. Uh, it's just Peter Thiel focused on that issue. I, you know, I think, I think that that's, uh, well, it, I don't know. I, I think there's, there's di different, different levels one could, one could, uh, look at it, but, uh, it is, um, I, I think that's the way the, the China's leadership sees it. Let's, you know, so it's, it's, it's always, you know, you have so there's, yeah, they, I think, I think that's the way the Chinese leadership sees it is his evidence. That's not really evidence. It's about the, 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 the Thucydides trap, the, the rising power meets the, the great existing power, and does this often lead to conflict? And, and I think in the Western world, you know, we've, uh, people have generally looked at this you know, rather optimistically. I don't, I don't really think that's the way people in, in China think of it they 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 think of themselves as you know on a on an ever greater collision course with with the west and then you know that on some level maybe it leads to armed conflict over taiwan maybe maybe it leads to some sort of um really violent decoupling in in in, in different ways um and uh and then th that's something you know that i think you know we we have to think about very hard peter too. There are people so, who, who, sorry, there are people who go, look, the threat of China has been wildly blown out of all proportion. And they'll point out to the fact of, you know, the demographic problem that China has with the old people, which is due to the one child policy. They'll look at the fact that the economy is not doing particularly well. In fact, some people are predicting it to go into a recession in the next couple of years. So we're overstating the threat of China. Where would you push back on in those points? Well, I, I certainly think we understated it for a very long time. Mm -hmm. yes. And so, uh, and there was probably, I don't know, there's sort of always, I think, a prehistory where uh, in, uh, in 19, uh, 1989, you would have, you know, I, I was thinking, you know, we had, you had Tiananmen in June of 89, the Berlin Wall comes down in, uh, November of 89, if it had been reversed and Tiananmen happened in June of 1990. So in summer of 89, what? Brent Scowcroft, the Bush 41 National Security Advisor, flies to Beijing, reassures them, we don't care about all these people who are killed in Tiananmen because you're anti-Soviet, you're blocking the Soviet Union. Six months, um, huh? and if it had happened the other way around, maybe we would have uh, we would have rethought the China thing back in 1990. What or, the shit or is he like talking this. about? And there were, yeah, there were surely um, this guy should write alternative history fiction or something, because that he'd have to write an entire alternative history fiction book to narratively explain the thing he just said. You know, very dubious decisions. There was the decision to admit China to WTO, there, um, and and sort of to you know to hollow out you know a, a great deal of the of of of, of, of the economies of, of the Western world. And um, you know, maybe it doesn't matter if we're if we're only concerned. But these about, were decisions you know, made by people like cost. Peter Thiel, uh, the 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 business people of their day. These the business people of their day were like, wait, labor's cheaper there, and they can build my shit. It's so much cheaper that it's cheaper to have it done there and then shipped back here. It was people like Peter Thiel that did that? It's a consumer to you know to buy, you know to buy a, to buy an electric car. But if, if these things have a military dimension um, and, uh, you know, you no longer have a shipbuilding industry in the UK uh, and then you will not have a Navy and you will not, and the UK will not have a role to play in protecting Taiwan. Wait, what? And, uh, and so, so, you know, the, the yeah, again, these, I, these, what uh, the, and I repeat, what the shit is he talking about? Uh, these, um, these, uh, these questions that one should have thought about. Uh, and so th I think there was, there was there was a great power version of this. Looks like we're going to go a little over on the podcast this week, but this is there's only what 10 minutes left on this and video, then, uh, so we'll we'll, we'll run a little long. Also an ideological version of this where uh where maybe 
you know, maybe there was a way to, to um, manage the rise of China if it had been, uh, if it had been transformed into a liberal Western democracy. You might have still had rivalry, might have still had, it was, you know, it was, it was non-trivial to have the handoff from, you know, the British Empire to this American-centric world. But what there was the a way, fuck? There was a way that could work. Uh, and, then, uh, and then there was some sense in which China was just not becoming a, a liberal democracy. And this is sort of where the, you know, Fukuyama end of history thing was, uh, has, been, has proven to be comically wrong. And people sh should have figured that out much earlier. You know, but that's a, that's one of them fucking airport books from the eighties, the the end of history or the eighties or the nineties, where you're like, shit, I didn't bring anything to read, and it's like nineteen ninety one, and you don't have an iPod or anything like that. So you buy, you're like, what is this book, the end of history, and then you fucking read it because there's nothing else to do on the airplane. They, and I think they would have figured it out in June of nineteen ninety if Tiananmen had happened one year later, and but for that because of that one year delay, it was something like, you know, may, maybe the maybe it took until the Trump presidency. That this even you know, this even started to 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 register uh, to register as an issue, um, and yes, I, I I don't know I I I you know I'm not I don't I don't think we should go to war with China. Um, I don't think. Uh, well, that's good. Me neither. <laughs> I don't think we should uh, start a massive global conflict with a nuclear superpower. But I think I think I think we should be very realistic about how. How deeply misaligned we are, uh, how um, you know, I mean, how the, uh, brain. sort of totalitarian ideology uh, is deeply incompatible with our values, and and all these ways where uh, where um, you know, in some sense, China wants to become America. Wait, what? And, but I thought you and, said they. Never mind. Forget it. Fuck it. And uh, that's he's contradicting himself. You know, wants to become the leading power, and that's. That's a, you know, that's a setup for, for a very, very difficult thing to manage. Peter, it's been an... Uh, let me ask, oh, uh, actually, yeah. a couple more. Uh, we've got a little bit of time. Yeah. Uh, on geopolitics, Peter, you mentioned totalitarian ideology. We have Iran, we have China, we have Russia, all making moves, to put it mildly, around the world. How do you see the geopolitical situation? It's like, well, I want whatever outcome makes me the most money. Well, they are, there's, there's some way where they are, they're all entangled. You know, they're all, they're all entangled with each other. They're all these things one has to, you know, one has to think of, of separately. Um, it's, uh, I don't know. They have like trade agreements with each other. Say about, about oh, each other. like we do with China. You know, probably, um, there probably are, it's, it's probably, there, there's probably a way that uh, um, the Middle, Middle Eastern policy of, of, of the U.S., of the Western world, should be focused extremely squarely on Iran and the Iran problem. And I think there are critiques one can have of the neoconservatives, of Obama, of all, all these different people the last uh, 20 years, where the focus was on Iraq or on um, on all these different, all these different things, and it, and it ended up being a distraction from Iran. And the reason I would say Iran is the most important one is, uh, you know, if if they if they achieve a nuclear weapon, um, I think that has the effect of radically destabilizing the Middle East. I don't think they would use the nuclear weapon, but it. it would but to be, be fair, the only people crazy enough to have used one in anger at this point is the United States. Up to actually, that they could um, they could uh, support Hezbollah, Hamas other things with far more impunity and you'd you'd get sort of a violent regional war you know we, the korean war starts in 1950 one year after the soviet union gets the bomb vietnam war starts 1965 one year after china gets the bomb and um because the bomb means uh, we can't really um we can't really hit back at the the people who are supporting the north koreans or the north vietnamese and so you get a very the north vietnamese regional what war. the and that's what that's, year is that's it why uh I think you want to you want to do a lot to prevent the Iranian uh, the I Iran from getting to the bomb, and that's that, that's that, you know that's the Middle East focused. That you know there's there's a there's a great deal that one you know that one can say about uh, about about Russia. Um, I think I was probably in 2016. I you know I gave two two speeches, uh, 
uh, for Trump at the, one of the convention and one of the Washington Press Club. I was not pro-Russia, but I was, I was sort of anti-anti-Russia involved. That this was not the battle we have. We, you know, we have a bigger crisis with China, and it's it's a distraction from that. Oh, did China um, invade their neighbor? Not yet. And uh, you know, the, the the place where I'm a little bit more confused on that at this point is that uh, I, you know, I think in some sense, uh, I think of Russia as as a you know, the the Ukraine Russia war. It's almost already a proxy for the conflict over Taiwan. And in some ways, wait, how is it a pro? Um, no, no, no. There may be ways in which there's a proxy war going on between the United States uh, and Europe and Russia, and Ukraine is in the middle of it. But Russia started it, and uh, other than other than well, no, it's it actually it has fucking shit all to do with China, the, Taiwan, actually it has fucking shit all to do with that. Um, Russia is a is a Chinese client state of sorts. It's like North Korea, or or something like that. It's very different, but. Um, I think he's, but, I think uh, I think this is then, all uh, and then, uh, this would all be pretty hard to prove. Then and then the real challenge is, is China which uh in some ways um you know uh um maybe the broader Chinese playbook is to sort of uh you know uh organize the developing countries against the developed world and this is sort of you know Iran is you know this poor country in the Middle East versus the wealthier Saudi Arabia or something like this. And, and then Wait, what? Russia is the, you know, the former Eastern Bloc country against Western Europe. And then there's a version of Russia that, is the former that Eastern Bloc. Didn't we, wasn't it, when we talk about the Eastern Bloc, wasn't that, don't we generally consider that to be countries that aren't Russia, that were part of the old Soviet Union? That's usually... Eastern European countries that used to be part of the, the Soviet bloc. We call that the Eastern bloc. I don't think we, we include Russia in that. At least not, not, not in the way that I understand it. In many other parts of the world that China wants to play. That's, yeah, that's, really that's client where states the, anyway. the problem of, of, of these is, is, is the way that they're all entangled with each other. You know? I, no, I was, I was going to actually ask, because we've touched on it, but we haven't spoken about it, which is Taiwan. I mean... <sighs> How do you see that situation evolving? Uh, it's Here, um, here's the answer. I don't know. Um, Say you don't know, man. It's fine. It's, 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 it's a, it's a, it is a, it's quite a big black box. I, I don't, I don't know if we're capable of defending Taiwan. Mm -hmm. And so I think we have to somehow be realistic about what our actual uh, military capabilities are, and um, no, we we. I mean, it depends on. Well, okay, so actually, we have to be realistic about how bad we want shit to get. If 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 China were to try to invade Taiwan, how bad do we want? I mean, I guess we could technically win, but like, what does victory look like? Victory in that case might end up looking like nuclear winter for everyone, and then like, I don't. That's not worth it. So like, it's not a matter of like, can the military do it? It's like, it's like the, the okay, first of all, like, does China want to do that? I mean, they may want, because it's, uh, I think a lot of it's the TSMC is there, <clears throat> but, and that's the only reason he gives a fuck, right? People like him, that's the only reason they give a fuck about Taiwan is that Taiwan semiconductor, TSMC, I forget what it, semiconductor manufacturing, I think it is. That's the only reason these people give a fuck. They don't give a fuck about the human beings that would murdered if if china were to invade taiwan he literally probably only cares about tsmc but i th i think if you know if the if the Chi taiwan crisis comes to head I, I don't know if we end up with a with a uh you know a full-scale war with china i think you end up with you know with extreme economic decoupling so uh you know uh, I, Ooh, I problem for the u.s with extreme if the U.S. had extreme economic decoupling with China, that that would be very bad for the United States. TikTok and for China, I don't. You, what, are you, what are you talking about? Wait a minute. No, nobody want. I don't think anybody's going to do shit because nobody. No, they don't. They don't want to lose their customers, us, and we don't want to lose the fucking store them. Like this is come on, man. And the other answer. What if I don't? What if it's just I don't know? Well, I don't know what's going to happen in Taiwan. Twenty-four hours after China invades Taiwan, and. uh and you know, 
you got the you know you got the Nord Stream pipeline between uh, Russia and Germany, and we have the equivalent of a hundred pipelines between China and the West, and the pipelines they will all blow up the day of the of the Taiwan invasion, and then um, and then I think I don't think it shakes um, out like that. Would be friend. well advised. I don't to, think uh, it shakes out think like about that. The decoupling to prepare for the decoupling in advance and uh, not have this fake notion that the coupling somehow creates stability. In the case of the Nord Stream pipeline, the coupling of Germany and Russia led to instability because it made Putin think you could invade Ukraine and Germany would not go along. And then the Germans didn't understand anything about energy. And so they, they, they were actually tough on Ukraine, but it almost blew up the whole economy. And, uh, you know, I think the China Taiwan thing, you have to think of the 100 pipelines between the West and, um, and China will blow up and, uh, Will they? Surely it's better if that happens on our timetable than theirs. Well, hey, at least there won't be a global government, right? <laughs> <laughs> Not for the time being. Not for the time <laughs> being. Peter, it's been an absolute pleasure talking with you. We're going to go uh, to you know, locals to ask our supporters. No global government possible in fucking the nuclear winter. Of the interview is always the same, which is what's the one thing we're not talking about? You talked earlier about political correctness, preventing people from saying what they should. What should we be talking about? Man, it's, it's just, it's, it's, it, it is... It is just always this this crisis of the West, how we get back to the future that we've been going through, and that, Wait, that, what? that's that's surely uh, you know how, how do you know I think the crisis of the West do, exists do, only because these people keep saying there's a crisis. We create a, a better world for the young generation in in, in these Western societies. Yeah, I don't know. Well, give us kids. some ideas on that. It's uh, it's you know I, I think so much. The, I, I, I would always say the paradoxical. Answers, you know, maybe, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll disagree with the premise of the question, you know, it's, or, or, or <laughs> undercut this interview too much. It's, it's always the, the, the UK bias is too much on the level of speech, too much on the level of, you know, sort of some Oxbridge uh, rhetoric debating society. Does he mean Oxford? Uh, the UK He's is, having a go at me, mate. Yeah, exactly. So you, well, right done. I just did a great the, speech. You did very well. You are, you are fantastic at, at that, that sort of a thing. And then, um, but you know, uh, the sophists, what they have in common with the biblical God is they believe in the omnipotence of speech. And, uh, and it's also, we just, you know, we need to act and we need to do things. And, uh, and, uh, you know, I, 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 I you know, I, I think talking about it is, is perhaps necessary, uh, but it, it surely is not sufficient. And, uh, we need to actually act on things and uh, and build the future. As a great philosopher once said, uh, a little less conversation, a little bit more action, please. There we go. We end the interview with me getting criticized by Peter Thiel. Head on <laughs> over to Locals, where I'm sure he'll do a lot more of that. Oh, God. I'm fucking... <clears throat> Every time we watch Peter Thiel, I get, like, super annoyed. Um, I don't know. His, his bullshit about how everything's stagnating and that, like, we're not making technological progress is just that. It's fucking bullshit. Um, and, uh... The just everything about him is just so odd and so weird. And his discussion, his obsession here with China is odd, just insofar as like his rise to being rich was enabled by hardware manufactured in China. Like, with if that, if there was no cheap labor and therefore. I guess, affordable electronics from China. I don't think that people like him would be where they're at. I don't really have much else to say. It's, it's very, <clears throat> it's very frustrating, I guess, listening to Peter Thiel, just because he's a guy who got lucky and doesn't seem to understand that he got lucky. I guess that's it. I don't know. I usually have more to say at the end of the show, but uh, I'm going to uh, change the color of the lights in this room. Ooh, I, I usually pour a cocktail. Ah, I guess I'll pour a cocktail. I'll change the content of the beverage in my drink and we'll be back for red light. I have uh, more brain rot in red light. Everybody, if you're listening on the podcast, you can get the whole show by watching live. That's uh, Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Pacific, twitch.tv slash Echoplex Media. Or, uh, patreon.com slash echoplex or even better eplex.store through fourth wall uh five bucks a month or higher you get the entire audio and video capture of the shows 
sent to your email the next day. I'd say the next morning, but that's a lie. It's the next afternoon. And um, I don't know. If you're watching live, listening live, whatever, uh, stick around. We'll be back for the post game in just a minute or four minutes. This is Boomers by Periscope. <laughs> 